that, that there's one study that has come out, and I said it was a new field, it's a very new field, we're just describing things from the, the outset. There's one study from Cork in Ireland where they showed um, that the, you know, the community loss, loss of the, the richness losses that occur in old age, but it's, it's not consistent. They had shown that individuals who live in homes, in retirement homes, for example, they have more profound loss of species richness uh, compared to those who live in their own households. Maybe have dogs, I don't know. But you, know, you have to think as well that there's a, probably a pretty common diet that uh, is consumed by those who live in a, a, a kind of a, a retirement home versus those who uh, don't. So, yeah, you get a loss of species richness. You know, it's just, we know in parallel that the immune response changes in old age. And it, I, for me, you know, it's kind of interesting that their infancy and old age are the periods of susceptibility to infection, but that's just parallel studies and us piecing it together. Nobody's shown that relationship in one study yet. Yeah. Um, I know you've been looking at a lot of respiratory allergies, but what about um, food allergies? Like for example, if a person had a gluten allergy, and if they, I guess my question is if they were to introduce the right microbes in the right way, would they be able to make that gluten allergy go away? Would they then be able to digest Yeah, there's, there's studies again in mice. Even though the perfect model is humans to study, there's studies in mice uh, by Catherine Nagler has, who has shown that, that you could manipulate the, the gut microbiome to change food allergic status of the, of the model animals. Um, there's also data that I know, and I, I'm not sure that it's been in, published yet, but there's a, a group that have shown that if you take uh, the gut microbiome from food allergic mice and transplant it into non-allergic mice, that you can transfer the phenotype of food allergy, so telling us that it is specifically the gut microbiome that is driving that food allergic response. That's also been shown for obesity. Uh, Jeff Gordon's wonderful papers, he was the first to show that uh, if you take uh, an OBOB, which is an obese mouse model, gut microbiome and transfer it to a lean mouse, the lean mouse will gain weight at a much higher rate than a, a, a normal mice. So you can tr transfer the, the uh, phenotype by, for a number of diseases, not all of them, by transferring the microbiome to the gut. Mm. Yep. In obesity, does it go the other way around? Yeah, you know, I need to read that paper because uh, I, I, somebody in a talk recently said it didn't, and then I thought I'd read that they did, they were able to reverse it, but it would make sense that you would be able to reverse it, so I need to go back. It's an old paper. I, I have to go back to you for a definitive answer. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Excellent talk. Thank you. Um, how important are eukaryotic microbes to the gut microbiome, or is that study because they don't have the 16SR? Yeah, so I mean, we've really focused on bacterial communities to date. We have been doing some work in fungi, particularly because we didn't see a bacterial signal associated with the children, for example, in their households that have um, uh, either HP or recurrent disease. And we're finding that it's fungi. That seems to be the, and that, that makes sense because fungi are a large number of allergenic uh, species of fungi are uh, a large number of fungi are allergenic. Um, then there's other data. There, yeah, there's there's viruses as well. There's helminths. There's a whole lot going on besides the bacterial species here. But we have to start somewhere, is what I, I would say. And the other fields are not as well developed at this stage. There's that. Great study from Mike McCune and Uma Mahadevan of a, a patient with inflammatory bowel disease who infected himself with helminths to try and induce the TH1 response, which is the counterbalance to the uh, TH17 response, or TH2 response associated with IBD, he essentially cured himself, but then got another flare much later on in life and then infected himself again and did was in remission again. So there's this idea that you can repopulate with kind of old friends that we've evolved with. Um, and, and uh, modulate immune responses. Though I don't know if that's going to be consistent with an N of one in that study. And that's really the only one that I know, for example, Hellman um, manipulation of the gut microbiome. Is Hellman, um, is that a fungus? Or Hellman's worms, sorry, worms. Worms, oh. Hellman, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, at the back you had a question. Well, I was following up on the previous question about archaea. What about archaea? Yeah, archaea. I forgot archaea as well. Yeah, and again, we really have not interrogated archaea. And I'm trying to scratch up my brain to remember there's one study recently that showed archaea associated with a disease indication, and it escapes me what that disease indication was. Uh, it's in very recent literature. I should be able to remember if I can. I'm sorry. But again, we you can pick up archaea with the 16S, the same primers, 
but we've tended to kind of um, ignore them, or they're at very low relative abundance in Zarkia and autism, actually. That was the, that was the link. Um, they tend to be a very low abundance in the healthy gut microbiome. So there's methyl, bready bacterium, smithy eye is the main one, I think, in the human adult healthy gut. Um, but there was that one link with an expansion of archaea in autistic children. Yes? I know you were discussing uh, the CDBCL and how uh, it is responsive to the transplants. And I'm curious to know what the, uh, uh, what the research is right now going into ulcerative vitalitis and uh, Crohn's disease. They have very heavy diseases that are so difficult to manage. Yeah. It, you know, what, what's happening there? And, yeah, so fecal transplant has been tried. That, that what I hear on the grapevine is a, about a 30% success rate for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so it doesn't seem to be as efficacious. And I, I, my, my personal just opinion is because you've, that's a far more long-standing disease process. So certainly with the seal infection is acute. It's an infection. And I think that that's the big differential of fecal transplant for an acute infection that will work very well versus a long-standing chronic inflammatory disease, where my belief is that you haven't just changed the microbes, you've changed the host response as well. And I, I believe that there's epigenetic changes in the host that really alter the colonization landscape of the microbes. And I think that that's a higher bar to try and overcome compared to something that's an acute infection and an outgrowth and a relatively recent perturbation for the community. Personal opinion, that's the differential between the two. Thank you. Yes. So once the client gets the allergic asthma, how can you change the gut biome to treat the asthma? We don't know the answer to that yet. I would have told you that. We need that answer. I would have told you that answer. I wouldn't have held back. I promise. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, every child is going to be different, and I can't give you one answer that's going to work for every child. And if we did have an answer, it looks like this, like the soul's John Sonai is promising, but we think we need to, as I say, support that with other species. We're actually doing studies right now in the lab with mice to look at safety and efficacy of a consortium of species to try and repopulate the, the gut microbiome and produce a suite of metabolites that we think are essential for modulating the immune response. Um, that's looking very promising, but after that we would need to go to clinical trials, and the first step is we would need to feed healthy children, that consortium, to make sure that it's safe, before we would go to a susceptible population. And that's the reality of this. It will be a number of years before we will have the answer of whether these specific manipulations with single species or consortiums of of species will actually be beneficial. And I'm not sure that they will work for everybody. We see genetic and ethnic variation in communities. We're looking at an inflammatory bowel disease, we're looking at South Asian and European populations, and what we're finding is their gut microbiome is very different in disease. So we've got two different entities that we need to treat probably quite differently. So I, I think until we can stratify our patients better, we believe we can stratify patients better by using the microbiome and looking at uh, pathogenic communities and their activities that uh, induce specific immune dysfunction in subsets of patients. And I think if we can carve up patients, not look at them all as being the same kind of disease entity, but looking at each individual group of patients as needing a specific and different treatment from the others, I think that's what will have greatest benefit. That's going to take a huge investment from pharmaceutical companies and the NIH to do that. But but they're on board. They're on board. Yes. Uh, is this study done to see the effect of changing uh, your diet, let's say, from meat eating to vegetarian? How that alter the population of microbiome? Yes. Yeah. There's there's a couple of studies that have actually looked at that. Um, the, the main one, uh, well, there's two. There's two that uh, a European consortium and a, a U.S. consortium. The U.S. consortium showed that you know seven days of introduction changing the diet can change the microbiome. But as I said, it's resilient. It changes back. I think the one of the, the cooler studies that's been done is by Steve Hazen's group, where he's shown that um, uh, TMA, and I can't remember the chemicals, trimethylamine. 
I'm going to call it trimethylamine. Actually, I think it is trimethylamine. Um, trimethylamine is uh, produced from carnitine, carnitine uh, in red meat, carnitine biotransformation by the gut microbiome. It's then oxidized in the liver, and very elevated levels of TMAO uh, is the biggest biomarker for cardiovascular disease, for arthrosclerosis. And what they showed, kind of a mean experiment, they took vegans and vegetarians, and they fed them meat. And what they showed is that their gut microbiome lacks the capacity to kind of transform carnitine to TMA. And so that tells us that the, the strongest select, or one of the strongest selective pressures is diet. And that we know from the other study, diet can shift the microbiome. There was a study also of, of children in Florence and Burkina Faso. Um, and what they showed was that, you know, a Western diet versus a, a traditional plant polysaccharide diet, those children have starkly different gut microbiome. And what makes us think it's diet is the biggest driving factor is that the kids in the African nation um, that eat a lot of plant polysaccharide, they're highly enriched for uh, Prevotella and Xylenobacter that have the xylenases necessary to degrade plant polysaccharides. And so on the other side, in the, in the, the Florence uh, group, they have fast-growing um, uh, enteric organisms that thrive on respiring easy to access glucose that's found in all processed foods. And so that tells us that it's really diet is one of the biggest factors we think that's driving the, the Western disease problems um, that we have, unfortunately. But that means it's an easy thing to change, right? We become more aware. And I don't think the message is, has changed. It's, you know, fruits and vegetables need healthily. But trying to get people to do that, and actually understanding how that message, you know, how that affects the gut microbiome, having some mechanisms by which that that message can you can actually see and know why what you're eating impacts your health. I think that maybe will help uh, shift people around to a healthier lifestyle. Yes. You mentioned uh, thinking back off of what Professor uh, Moore said. Uh, you said seven days. Is that? Yeah, that was the experiment. Seven days. Okay, so how about how long does it typically take for uh, a microbiome community to balance? To come back. To come Two to three weeks. It changes, as I said, in, the, in also in the in the uh, antibiotic study, which I think is an even more profound perturbation that you can elicit. Two to three weeks. We've seen it in cystic fibrosis patients in their airways. So they'll have a type of community, they'll have a pulmonary exacerbation, they'll be given antimicrobials. They'll go from having 700 types of microorganisms to 70. And then within two weeks, their community looks exactly as it did before they got the antimicrobials. In the gut, it seems the same, two to three weeks. We think it might be predicated somewhat on the environment of the individual as well. And that's an opportunity when you've depleted microbes and you've kind of taken out the competition to repopulate the community from the environmental sources. So we think that that may play a role in the repopulation dynamics as well. Yes? Oh, that's a great, there's been, yeah. <coughs> yes, yeah. I have a very close colleague and friend who has a family member with alcoholism and he wants to do that study. Um, and there has been some evidence that uh, it can drive certain uh, nutritional requirements, or what's not nutritional requirements, but certain cravings and needs. And the, the microbiome of addiction is uh, something that we're really interested in. But there's been no work done on it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our spring our series will start in February. So look at the sign. Questions or